What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Backside Ground Balls podcast, where we are coming to you live from the locker room here at the University of Delaware in Newark, Delaware. We got a full day interviews, facilities tour. Right now, we're lucky enough to sit down with the Blue Hens pitching coach, Casey Kalina. Casey, thank you for sitting down and having us today. Yeah, Dan, absolutely. Thank you guys for uh, coming down here, and it's going to be a fun time. Yeah, um, so second year, obviously, here is the pitching coach. Um, you, you were at Polk State as a player. You pitched at Jacksonville, um, played a little pro ball. That's where I kind of want to start. Talk a little bit about the experience of going from being a junior college guy to, to ending up in, in, in the big leagues and kind of what even maybe some of the lessons you learned during that journey that, that you've now been able to take with you as a coach. Yeah, for sure. It was uh, it was a journey. <laughs> <laughs> like any typical uh, four two four guy, you know, so started out at Penn State and, you know, saw just whatever wasn't in the cards to be there. So it's like, well, let's go JUCO and um, – you know, JUCO had its own experience and then finished at Jacksonville, then, you know, ultimately got a shot in the D-backs org. So, like, each each step kind of had its own kind of mini journey, yep. um, you know. So, kind of, you know, at Penn State, just I pitched a lot as a freshman, stuff like that. And then second year, just unfortunately, you know, was hurt early on. Some other stuff came to fruition throughout that year. It was just like, you know, it might not be the best fit. And just got some advice from people I knew, people I trusted, like, hey, junior college is, you know, great possibility and, you know, I think you should try to explore it. So went 17 hours from home down the <laughs> down to the heart of Central Florida at Polk State. Uh, I always tell people there's more cattle than people down there. But um, <laughs> this is probably, probably the point that changed my career, what was junior college, just kind of sent it on a different, you know, trajectory, um, all that stuff. So really thankful for that time. Um, experienced a lot there. Um, really the JUCO life, just kind of people talk about the JUCO bandit type thing yep. and all that. Like yep. it's real, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a real thing. You know, there's, it takes a special type of, you know, coach to coach the JUCO. It takes a special type of player to, you know, play at that level, stuff like that. So it was a really cool experience. Um, just how much really, you know, programs are able to make the most out of what they had. Yeah. You know, I didn't know anything about, you know, Polk other than they were a really good program before I went down there. They had been to the world series two years before, um, so I knew it was going to be really good baseball, but you know, once you actually get down there and see, like, man, this is like a, you know, this is like a high school field, and, you know, just it's baseball. It's all it is. You got a cage area, baseball field, and some other, you know, some other ragtag stuff around, and that's what you have. But that was a cool part about it. Like, just really learned how to not only get creative in your own development, but just kind of you know rely on each other as well. You know, we relied on each other a lot as teammates. Yep. Um, bouncing ideas off of each other and everything like that, just because that, that's all we had. We had us, and we were spending long hours together and, um, you know, really got to form a tight bond and everything like that. So, um, yeah, just like a creativity standpoint, you know, both as a player and then coaching at your junior college level, like it takes a lot of that as well because you're not, not going to have all the bells and whistles, you know, uh, budget-wise and everything like that, especially where we were there. Um I think my second to last year there, we were lucky. We were one of the JUCOs that got Yacker Tech down there. Yeah, sure. But up until that point, I mean, we were, you know, just classic, you know, roll the ball out, play, and, <laughs> you know, do, you know, take some challenging BP, make bullpens challenging, like all that. And that's what we had to do. Um, but I think it was a huge part, you know, not only of, like I said, the playing journey, but the coaching journey as well, just because you got to get creative. Like you're in bullpens, you're learning, you know, sure. what external cues work, you know, rather than, trying to focus on mechanics all sure. the time. It's like, what can I do to get this guy to get this job done? And, you know, you're working on, you know, just experiment with all the external stuff, like on a breaking ball, like, hey, get your knuckle, get your knuckle to the catcher's mask. Right. Or, hey, stay sideways longer. You know, just all those different things you're trying to get creative with because it, that's what you have. Right. Um, so it was really valuable, you know, learning all that stuff. Um, and just the brotherhood and the relationship thing, both as a player and as a coach at the junior college level, I mean, that's all you have is the guys. Like, it's not going to be glamorous or anything like that. So, um, and you're doing field maintenance together. You're riding on the vans together. Right. Like, you're you're literally spending every hour of the day together. Um, and even with just there being no rules restrictions or anything, like, you're on the field for long hours. Like <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's not, you know, little skill groups for 30 minutes, you know, at a time for the first month. Like, it's full team practice as soon as we show up, you know, all throughout the fall. Um, so just doing that, like you really learn the relationship aspect, like you really get to know your guys yep. as a player, you really get to know your teammates. So, um, really special and just kind of learning how to, you know, form those bonds. You know, you're more than just a baseball coach to those guys. You're their academic coach, you're right. their strength conditioning coach. Yep. Um, you're their life coach. Yep. Like, you know, our office was attached 
to our locker room, which is right off the back of our dugout. So like our dugout, our locker room, and our coaches' offices were wow. all one, yeah, all one place, you know. So the guys are, you know, we're around them in the locker room even, and they're coming through our door. Their locker room's right outside our door, so always was open communication, and you know I think that was like a huge part of it. Just like we were able to get so close to the players. And that's a big part of it. You know, the more you do this, you realize the relationship aspect is just so huge. So yep. I think that was the biggest part of the JUCO experience was just basically being a part of each little part of each guy's, you know, career, um, academic-wise, strength conditioning-wise, life coach-wise, baseball coach-wise. I think that was the most special part about it. Like, you truly get to know yeah. each guy. <clears throat> it's that more – you said the, the JUCO bandit term that everybody loves it, but it's the, it's the more with less, right? Understanding and learning, even as a player, as a coach, how to, how to create more with less. And uh, So then you spend four years there as a pitching coach, correct? And then yep. you, you come up to the University of Delaware here in your second year. Um, kind of as you got into that first year last year, what was some of the keys for you to kind of, you know, starting to build that trust and starting to, you know, kind of implement what your philosophy is on the mound with the guys here at, at, at Delaware? Yeah, a lot of that started, I think, the summer coming in as soon as all, as soon as all of us got the job. And this is credit to Coach Mams just with, you know, the type of guy he is and, um, you know, his, you know, his preaching of, you know, the relationship aspect of things is, you know, one of our first things I had to do and our assistant at the time, Coach Colazzo, had to do was, you know, call every single call every single pitcher, yep. call every single position guy and just, just talk with them. Yep. You know, like, hey, you know, how's your summer going? You know, where are you from? Just all the initial introduction stuff. Then also, too, get into the nitty-gritty of, you know, what have you been doing this summer? Are you playing summer ball? What's your throwing been like? Like, let's get, you know, let's get the program, you know, ready to roll so that way when you arrive in the fall, like, you know, your arms in shape are ready to go. Um, so that's really where it started was over the summer, just reaching out to every single guy, taking whatever, 15, 20, 30 minutes, talking with each of them, learning a little bit about them. And then, you know, obviously from there, seeing where they were at throwing wise. Um, so we could set up their, you know, summer throwing program and make sure they were ready, you know, to come in, you know, come in here in the fall. Um, and giving them a voice, I think is something big, always, you know, giving them a say in what they need to do. Cause it is their careers. Right. Like we're, you know, we're, you know, we're the ones that should be catering to their careers always, you know, it's not always about us. Um, so I think giving them say and, you know, what they need to do moving forward with certain things plays a huge role. So I think that was big. Um, and that's something that, you know, starting it there that summer, that's what has continued, you know, especially with throwing programming and stuff like that. Just making sure we take time. Hey, each individual guy, we got to talk with them, plan it out, see what they're feeling, see if they have any personal things that they know they need to add yep. that, you know, that makes them tick, that gets them right on the mound. Um, so just all that stuff, we have to take time to get them, you know, to get them going and know them better. Yeah, and I, I love that you bring bring that up because it's <clears throat> it's you know you talk about them being in charge of their career, and you talk about you know every guy needs something different, especially with pitchers. You know, I I used to joke all the time when I was doing it. It's like it's, you're kind of a you know I don't want to use the term babysitter, but like you got to take care of these guys because this guy this guy needs something different than this guy, and this guy needs something. There's always an issue, right? Like there's always something you got to do. So you know, and at the same time, you know, we are in such a time in baseball where individualized training, you know, facilities and the Age of data and information where guys know so much more and, and guys are at a facility throwing and and that setting is so completely different than a practice setting right that's what I always used to think about I was like when we get to practice there's you know this isn't a group of four of you at a facility where we have an hour two hours this is we got two hours we have a specific plan and there's 20 of you how can you can you explain a little bit or, or, or maybe even some of the challenges or of running a division one pitching staff in an age where individualized training is so, you know, dominant, right? Like the individual, everyone's going somewhere, you know, whether it's one of the big facilities, a smaller facility by their house. What are some of those challenges and how do you kind of work around the fact that I got to take care of 20, 20 guys at this practice today? It can't just be about four of you. Yeah, great question. And you hit it on the nose. Pit- pitchers are needy. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> we're, I'll admit it, we're, as one of them, we're needy. Like for whatever reason, they need to be whatever, catered a little bit more, all that stuff. It always drives the position players crazy because they're like, you know, you guys are pitchers. Like, you're not anything special. Right. Like, they right. just, you don't get it. Like, it's just got to go the extra mile sometimes with, you know, with pitchers. It's just, you know, it's how we are. We're weird. We're weird as it is. And when it's left-handed on top of that, it's even more weird, you know. Right. So, um, but, no, that's probably the biggest challenge, I know, for me last year was one of those things because, like, obviously, Juco, like, you have all the time you need. Right. You got all the time you need with the guys. Um, you know, like if they need something on a Sunday, like, you know, we play Saturday. Guys got some post-outing stuff to do on a Sunday morning. Like, can go out and 
spend an hour or two out there doesn't right. matter. Right. You know I mean, you got the time to do it. You got the hours. Um, there's no rules, you know, with any of that stuff. Um, so that was a big adjustment moving up to this level, obviously, with, you know, just NCAA hour stuff and all that, us having to go through skill group periods for a month, um, you know, before we start team practice, large group work, all that stuff. That was probably the biggest adjustment just because the organization piece is so important. Yeah. You know, to start answering your question, like, it all comes down to the organization. Like, you have those, whatever, 18, 19, 20 guys. Um, you know, how can we make sure we're making the most of the time that we get with them in an efficient fashion in order to, you know, get the most out of that time, get them better in that period, whatever it might be, whether it's a skill group period, a practice period, um, individual practice day, stuff like that. Um, so that was the biggest adjustment is making sure, like, all right, you know, we actually do have some time constraints now. How, how do we make the most out of this? Because right. we don't have all the time in the world. Um, you know, so that's just another thing where, like, communication organization was key. Um, something I think we do really well here overall, you know, really on our board over there at the end of the locker room here, like full fall calendars posted, our week to week stuff is posted in our group me app that we have on our phone. Where we communicate with pitchers and hitters, you know, individually as groups, daily plans, weekly plans are put out. So that's a huge part of it. And right. it's a part the guys appreciate, you know, they like knowing what they have on the table going into a given day. Um, you know, before they get after, you know, they don't, they don't like the old man just found out an hour before, you know, oh, obviously, right. obviously, obviously weather and stuff, you know, that'll happen at times, but on a standard day, weather's good. We know what we're doing, everything like that. Like it's, you know, it's planned out well in advance. So I think that's a big part of it. Like giving the guys a plan, something to attack. They can see something in the future. Like, all right, yeah, this is where we're working towards. Let's, let's get after it. You know, I think that's a huge part of it. Um, then, you know, making sure, like you said, making sure the individual needs are met because we are in this. I think it's a cool time in baseball. No question. Where we have, yep. you know, we have all these facilities popping up. Kids are getting access to more at a younger age. I'm sure, like, we're both the same way. Like, wish we had access to half of this yes. stuff when we were coming yeah. up with our career. Yep. Like, you know, why does my ball do this? Yep. You know, what you know, what am I doing here? Right. Like, can we slow this down a little bit more and see what's going on? Um, you know, so I think it's a really cool time in, in college baseball and in baseball in general is, yep. you know, kids are having access to this, all this new information, this new technology, because it can really help them. Um, and it's just, I think it comes down again to the communication aspect and investing in their, their side of their career. Um, cause I think anymore, like the guys are in it right now, like chances are, chances are a lot of our guys that are on winter break right now, like they're going to be doing their throwing. Right. At the facility they've trained at through middle school, through high school, right. all that stuff. And, you know, I don't think it has to be that situation where it's always like, hey, don't go there. Like, we got yeah, our no. stuff going on yeah. here. Like, no, I'm a big believer, and it's why I try to talk with the guys so much about it. I'm a big believer. And there are certain things you have done up until this point that got you recruited on campus to pitch on our staff. Right. You know, and a lot of that was formed, whatever, in that facility environment with that high school coach, with – with that pitching lesson coach, whatever it might be, like there are a lot of things that, you know, will help your career that are deep rooted in those areas, you know, so I've just always been the believer of, you know, kind of would be wrong to, you know, kind of push them away from that stuff, you know, as long as it aligns enough with, no you know, no the doubt. team goals and what we're trying to do, you know, to win a championship, which, um, you know, thankfully, and I think the, this probably isn't the norm anyways, but I don't think it really ever conflicts too much anyways, no. you know, because yeah. at the end of the day, all the kids are trying to do is become the best baseball player they can be. Right. You know, and obviously that's our job to help them on that journey, and we don't have to be the only person in that journey. Right. You know, I think it's the biggest thing, you know, because I think in both of our careers we can look back and be like, you know what, like this pitching coach helped me here a ton in this way. This head coach helped me here a ton in this way. This right. whatever facility guy or this strength coach helped me in this way, and – they all just kind of have a way of blending together and helping give you the knowledge in those areas along the way to where hopefully at some point you can put it all together yourself. No question. At the end of your college career, start of your pro career, whatever, and, you know, then you roll, you know, with that. So um, I think it's all, like I said, it's all communication. Like we did it with the winter programming because, you know, like I said, it's the popular time for guys to go back to a facility yep. like – Every single throwing program, guys sat down in the office. We talked one on one, like, "Hey, do you need a shutdown period? Right? Um, do you want to keep throwing? Like, that's where it starts. Like, here's here's where we need to be. Come, you know, February sixteenth, seventeenth, whatever the start date is. Let's work backwards. Like, you know, what do we need to do here? How many days you want to throw each week? How do we want to progress it? Um, then all all that stuff always comes into play too, where it's like, all right, you know what." you know, what drills do you need to do or, like, just what individual stuff are you going to have access to at the facility right. that you're going to want to go through? Right. 
and we make sure we include that in the program. You know, just because, like I said, there's certain things that a kid, he needs it. It gets him right on the mound, and he's done it for a long time. It's led to success, and if he's successful, then it's going to be it's going to work out for us. You know, so we always just want to make sure we communicate and include that stuff. So it's really kind of how we blend it. You know, like I'm like you said, I'll be the last person to say that it's got to be you know our way or the highway. Right. Um, you know, just because was fortunate enough to have so many good different coaches along the journey, I kind of realized like it takes a little bit of everybody. Yep. You know, I've always said like nobody nobody ever does anything great without the help of great people along the way. No question. So you want to be able to make sure the guys have access to those, you know, those people throughout their career. So, yeah, and sometimes, right. It's, it's as simple as if it's in the best interest and it works for the kid, then just let them, let them have at it. Right. Like yeah. you said, you don't need your hand, you don't need your fingerprints all over it. You know, sometimes with, with, with coaching, you know, some people, you know, not maliciously, but they want to feel like they, you know, they had something to do with the kid's success when sometimes just, Stepping back and looking is just that, that's the best thing you can do for that kid because they've got, you know, just, you know, keep them on the path they're already on because they're where they need to be. You don't need to come in and put your fingerprints all over it. And uh, <clears throat> it's funny, I don't think a lot of people realize how much, especially being a pitching coach, logistics are involved, right? You talk about planning everything out and, you know, guys knowing what they what they need to be doing, when they need to be doing it because, like we've said, pitchers are a little bit needy. So logistics are such a huge part of it. And, especially with the college baseball calendar, right? You know, I always found that fascinating because you, you get guys in in the first semester, right, and you're in an, an off-season type programming where you said individuals and you got your fall season, you're inter-squatting, yep. you're getting them up. Then they get this month off <laughs> where they, they, they walk away from the program and then they come back and you got a couple weeks and you got to get them ready to compete and be ready to win baseball games, help the team win baseball games. Then summer rolls around and some guys go to summer ball, some guys need to shut. So, how do you kind of navigate the schedule? What do you th think are some big keys like, you know, in the fall, you know, it's important for you guys to do this in the, you know, in winter break and then leading up to the season, it's important for this. And then in the summer, you, you know, do you guys like sending a lot of guys to, to summer ball or you guys, you want guys to kind of shut it down, train, lift, you know, kind right. of rehab after the, the, the season they've been through. Right. Once again, all relative to the individual situation right. that each guy has, obviously. Um, that's where, like I said, like it's, big with phone calls over the summer, just knowing where each guy's at, how they're feeling. Um, as early as kind of, you know, a couple of weeks after the season ends, just kind of like, hey, how you feel after this year? Like, how much time are you going to need off? Or, like, you know, are you going to want to keep throwing again? Like, just all those, you know, general questions that we ask all the time. Um, but I think more try to tell the guys a lot of times in the fall, you know, and Coach Mann's like same way, just kind of, you know, no job's going to be won the first two weeks of right. the fall. Right, You know what I mean? So, Ideally, if we can have a nice, you know, through skill groups, through once we start team practice to once we start inner squads, really what I preach to the guys in our preseason presentation and everything is, can we get better each week? Can we just, can we see progress each week? So whether that progress is, hey, we're, whatever, we're at 75% off the mound for 15 pitches, like, can we be at 20 pitches at 80% the following skill group week, build up our pitch count, build up our endurance from there? Can we make progress that way? Right. Um coming in body wise like you know this is where we're at in our strength conditioning program after two or three weeks can we see pro you know can we see progress with that you know so I think the biggest thing at least I try to preach to our guys in the fall is that like just whatever wherever we're at at the start of the fall here can we see continual progress throughout the fall to where by the time we get to the end of the fall can we look at you and say hey this kid's going to help us in right. the spring right you know what I mean we're not we're not going to be doing that week one week two maybe even the first month of you know seeing each other right um, so that's why I just try to preach the little things like, you know, make sure make sure we get our routines established. Like what's our daily throwing routine going to look like individually? What's our weekly plan going to look like? Like what do we want to work on in bullpens and stuff working, you know, working through the early part of the fall here? That's where a lot of those conversations go right. towards. And then eventually, like I said, as we get throughout the fall, we start, you know, competing in inner squads more and stuff like that. Then the focus kind of shifts more to like, OK, at the end of the fall, what what are you looking like? Right. You know, can you, you know, can you be in the cards for us? Have you made a lot of improvement? Um, you know, have we seen progress from you? Have you felt it? And do you feel like you're in a good spot at the end of the fall to where you can contribute and help us win win games in the spring and win a championship? Yep. You know, so this is kind of the progression from there. You know, we're never going to be kind of right away just, hey, we got to be, we got to be 30 <laughs> ready to pitches go. 100% ready to go. Let's fire it up. You know, it's, it's a little bit of a progression, you know. Right. And obviously, you got guys that are coming off summer ball, guys right. that are coming off not throwing much over right. the summer. 
you got the high school kid who this is his first college fall, which that's always an eye opener. Yeah, so they think yeah. they're ready. Oh, they think they're ready to take it on. <laughs> they come in all built up, like ready to go. But you know, it happens by about the first month or halfway through the fall. They're like, man, that's they hit that wall. Baseball, lifting, <laughs> academics. That that's for real. Uh -huh. You know, so you get you got to manage those as well. So that's the thing. Like you can't can't go too gun ho too early. Right. You know, then obviously, like I said, it's all about too knowing where each individual guy's at at the start of the fall. So we have. Have a definite plan of progression. And then once we get that established, like you said, all that matters is, at least for me early on, is just are we doing the little things well? Do you have a good routine established? And can we make progress each week? Right. And I think that I think that, you know, you, you make such a good point talking about routine and you need to yeah. be able to develop a routine, right? Because I think that, you know, one of the biggest keys is is there's so many different ways to get to where you need to be and be successful, right? There's everybody we've talked about how it's individual for guys. But having a routine, every guy needs yep. something. And when you're talking about a staff of 20 guys, how do you go about building the routine with them? Is that something where in the fall, okay, let's see what you guys got. Let's let's you know start to build it with, I'm going to give you guys a couple of drills here. We'll see how it works. How do you kind of go about helping these guys build a routine that they're comfortable with that can allow them to be successful? Yep, I agree with you 100%. Like it, it's huge, probably one of the most important things as a baseball player in general, but especially a pitcher. Um, no coach man's is huge on it with the hitters. Like that's all they preach a ton early in the fall, like routine, 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 right. like, you know, have your routine set. Um, I just think it's always big. Just more start with like the mental aspect. When you have a routine, you're on autopilot. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. So if you have a routine, you could show up to the yard and really the only thing you have to execute that day is go be a competitor and go help your team win. You know, yep. Whereas like, if you don't have a routine, what that, what that causes is more thoughts to creep into your head. Cause you're like, do I need to do this? Am I doing this here? Like all these thoughts start creeping in your head. Every single one of those thoughts takes away from you just going out on autopilot and just being a flat out competitor and trying to get the job done. Yep. So I think that's the most important thing for having a routine is if you have a routine, you can simply show up to the yard, you're on autopilot. Then all you have to do is just flip the switch. Yep. Your routine takes you all the way up to that point where you're ready to flip it. And then once the game starts, you flip the switch and you're out there competing, playing baseball. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a huge part of it. Why we preach it so much um, then it also too, just goes along to like, each guy is a little bit different and he's got to have that set routine. And I think a lot of it's cause our bodies naturally, they love routine. Yep. I think you go to the basics of sleep. Like we have the whole circadian rhythm thing, you know, the sunrise sunset influencing our sleep patterns, everything like that. So like, you know, I, I always had the analogy of like a little baby too, like, <laughs> When a baby's hungry, he's going to let you know. You know, when he's <laughs> yeah. pissed, when, when he woke up too late or he didn't get enough sleep, he's going to let you know. Right. When he's hungry, he hasn't had enough to eat, he's going to let you know. Right. I think, you know, you just go back to those basic things. Like, it kind of shows us that our bodies love routine. Yes. They love routine. They love rhythm. Um, some more for just allowing guys to have the best chance at, you know, having success, staying healthy, being consistent ball players. you know, all that stuff, performing well starts with that routine just because like that's going to put your body and your mind in the best best scenario to do that um so that's a big part of it and then as far as implementing individual routines it goes back to the one-on-ones like it's more just talking with those guys like hey what do we need to do pre-throw what type of catch play are we doing on certain days like say you just got done with an outing what's that next day looking like for you, you know we basically plan out the week on a micro scale and then we just have them right. repeat that throughout the fall like yep. you know they'll come in Hey, what's a tip? So if we're inter squatting Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, whatever it might be, say we're hot those days, like what what's Monday looking like? Right. What's Tuesday looking like for you? So we just plan that out. Um, a lot of it's on like Google Drive, Google Sheet type sure. stuff. So then that way if we need to switch anything right, up on just the fly, as needed. they can access it. I can access it in real time and we can make you know, we can make the switch. Um it's like the same with how the winter programming is, like all that stuff's on Google Sheet, Google Drive, so they can go in. Something happens, they get sick one day, they got to bump it back, whatever right. else. Hey, coach, I had this going. Hey, let's go in, let's switch it up. Yep. You know, so that's really how it works with the routines as well in the fall, just kind of working day to day throughout the whole week, each individual guy. Because, you know, like you said, there are going to be those different guys. Like some guys after an outing, they might go out and long toss again. Like right. You have, those, you have those guys. No doubt. It's impressive. You're just like, hey, I don't know how you do it, but <laughs> they do it. Uh, but then you have guys on the opposite end of the spectrum where it's like, I don't really pick up a ball the day after I, you know, I get after it. Right. You know, so we got to make sure we meet those individual needs and cater to that. Um, and like I said, you know, it's just it's a communication point. It's a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Hey, let's work through this together. Make sure we have everything we needed, um, you know, for you, and let's get it implemented and roll. Yeah. So. What? Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what 
traits, tangible and intangible traits, you know, kind of make up a successful pitcher here at the University of Delaware? You know, what kind of things do you want to see from guys? What types of, of, of characteristics do they have? Yeah, just start with the intangible stuff. I think a competitor, number one. Right. Um, guy that loves to win, guy that wants to compete for, you know, his teammates, compete for the program. Um, and that even goes to recruiting, like watching a guy, like, you know, really the first thing I kind of look at is when the team breaks out along the foul line and, you know, they head out to the field, does this pitcher look like he's taking the mound ready, the presence, to, ready yeah. to rip somebody's head off, yep. ready to attack some hitters and go out and dominate and win the game for his team? Like, does that guy have that? whatever, that walk, that swagger, that initial presence when he first takes the mound before warming up that first inning, like, does it look like he's on a mission? Yep. Um, you know, so that's a big thing, you know, for me, for us as a program is making sure we get guys that are competitors, they're going to be tough, and they're going to want to win games and win championships. Because um, really, I mean, outside of being surrounded by really good people, yeah. what's going to lead to a great college experience is, is winning yep. and having fun competing, you know, because I'm sure, like, we can all look back and be like, some of the best times I had playing college baseball or best moments I had were probably after a win. No doubt. Or probably after we won a championship or after we had a successful game or something yep. like that. Like, those are always the best memories to look back on. So, like, if you want a kid to have a good college experience, look back on something positive. A lot of it's around, you know, winning and being competitive yep. with the boys and all that stuff. So, want to make sure we're, you know, getting those types of kids, making sure we're preaching that culture. Um, and we compete a lot. That's the biggest thing. Like, in the fall – Everything's tracked and posted up on our main board here in the locker rooms. So like every single week, guys know where they stand on certain you know metrics that we keep track of. Are you number one? Or are you number twenty? Like you're gonna know every single week where you're at. Um, we split into a pitcher's fall brawl, uh, which is pretty cool. We get the top two innings guys from the previous year. They draft two teams. We go through our pitcher's fall brawl. So um, inner squad, some certain things are on the line. Uh, PFP, some certain nice. stuff is on the line. <laughs> um, we did a couple different conditioning stuff. You know, stuff was on the line. So, really, we try to put something on the line for the pitcher's fall brawl every single every single day or at least multiple times a week. Um, and the guys love that. It was really cool to see them embrace that and get after it. I mean, to the point where we got, like, team defense going on in practice and, like, Coach Tor and I got the stopwatches out. Man's hitting the fungos. And like, you got both sides locked in. The yeah. where it's like, hey, we got, we got to execute this, you know, this 3-6-1 double play here. Like, you got to make sure you cover or – hey, make sure you execute this pitcher double play to second base just because they knew stuff was on the line. And it led to a lot of fun, a lot of really quick, focused, efficient periods in practice. So, like it, you know, so that's just a big thing we try to preach is just, you know, being a competitor no matter what you do, like whether it's the practice drills like that, um, you know, whether we're doing pitching-specific stuff in the bullpen and all, like we're always trying to compete. Um, so that's a big intangible part of it. Um, also, too, just because, I mean, a lot of guys, like, you know, especially the guys playing behind you in the field as a pitcher, they want a competitor on no the doubt. mound. Yep. You know, if they're going to lay out or give, you know, go the right. extra mile or, you know, do something crazy to try to help the team win, chances are they're going to be more inclined to do it when they know they got a dog on the mound. No question. Guy, who, guy who's fighting for them, guy who's attacking the zone, working fast, all of that stuff. So that's just why we preach it, too, just because, you know, it helps that brotherhood kind of really come together when guys know not only are they a competitor themselves, like they – they got competitors around them. Um, so that's a big part. Um, attacking the zone, you know, working fast is big, especially in our program. Like we have certain parameters throughout the fall where we got the stopwatches out again to where if the guy's not throwing, you know, pitches in a certain amount of time, like, you know, if he's at like whatever, 16 seconds instead of 12 or 11, right. he's going to hear it. Yeah. Like, hey, that's a warning. And obviously there's a, you know, a little bit of a consequence for the second time. Same thing with times of the plate, everything like that. So we have some parameters in place where we preach kind of, hey, you got to work fast, all right? You got to be efficient in your times of the plate, stuff like that. Um, so that's big for another reason. Like it shows your attacking hitters. It shows we're the dominant ones on the mound. We're asserting, we're asserting our force on the hitter. Um, but also, too, more for the defense, too. It keeps the defense moving quick, keeps them in the game, um, everything like that. So that's a big one. Uh, attacking the zone, like I said, is huge for me. It'll give us at least two pitches. Right. You know, I mean, if we got a fastball we can compete with and one other off-speed pitch that we can throw in any count, we can we can compete, get out, and win with that. You yep. know, if we get pitches three and four, especially as starters, great. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, from the most basic level, you know, relievers into a you know a blossoming starter or whatever, like hey, give us give us two pitches we can go out and compete with in, in any count. Yeah. Um, so really, really big on that. Uh, just as far as like just kind of how how one pitcher should approach it, you know, good mound presence, confident, um, some good swagger, 
loves loves competing, loves the big moments. Because um, I think pitching is probably the, if not the most competitive position on the field, which you know I think it is. It might be a little bit biased, but you know, I think you're going to need a competitor on yes. the mound to execute that job. Because um, there's going to be guys on base. You got the ball, and nothing can happen until the ball leaves our hands. So like we were just in control of so much out there, and obviously with great control comes a lot of responsibility. You know, so you want a competitor out there who's able to, you know, take it head on, be responsible for all those things and execute it to the best of his ability. Um, so that's huge. Um, pitch execution wise, the two pitches for strikes are huge. Um, and that's really, you know, that's really it. Like right. any, everything from there starts getting kind of the more of the player development side and, you know, fine tuning some things. But as far as the basics, just want an absolute competitor out there who loves playing baseball, who wants to win. Um you know, who can attack the zone with at least, you know, with at least two pitches, any count. Right. So that's, that's kind of the basics that we can work with. And then on, on a little bit onto the player development side here, you know, we're in an age also, we talked about individualized training, but there's also so much data now, right? There's, and, and the data is so accessible for guys and, and guys are coming in smarter and smarter every year, right? Yeah. Like because they're getting introduced to it at a younger and younger age, you know, you're seeing high school kids that chasing numbers and understanding spin and understanding things like that. How do you kind of go about managing not overloading guys, but giving them access to that information to help them? Because to me, one of the, you know, I never wanted to shy away from a lot of that data because it's like, well, we can make adjustments so much quicker now. Like you're talking about at the JUCO level, like, you know, when, when you didn't have as much, like taking the knuckle, taking the knuckle on the breaking ball to the plate or whatever it may be, or snapping it down or staying through the fastball, whatever those cues might be. Well, now you have tangible evidence to say, okay, I made this adjustment. What's the difference between the adjustment, what I was doing and the adjustment now? So how do you kind of manage not overloading players, but also, you know, giving them the stuff to help them develop? Right. It's a great question because it's kind of the ultimate balance, right? Yep. You don't <laughs> you don't want to say too much, but there's also times where if you say too little, you don't drive the point home, you know. And I think um, whatever the data versus feel or you know whatever real versus feel type, right. you know, all those different conflicts that you deal with as a coach and as a player, um, you know, it's kind of an art. I guess you just you know you're constantly refining, constantly refining that art and trying to find better ways to communicate it and stuff like that. But um, I think like anything else, it's a really helpful tool. You know, it's not it's not everything, um, but it's a really helpful tool. You know, just like anything else, where if we didn't have it, like obviously you're going to be at a <laughs> going to be at a disadvantage right. as well. You know what I mean? So can't totally write it off, but like you said too, can't totally make it the absolute focus of everything. You know what I mean? To where it's point of paralysis by analysis and everything like that. Like you kind of have to have that good balance. Um, but really, it's more just kind of not rushing guys into it too much. Like especially the new guys. Like there's a lot of things. Like really, the biggest things we, you know, work on with freshmen. The biggest thing they struggle with is, with anything is not knowing. It's not not knowing the data or like not knowing any of those things or like how they move and stuff like that. It's more learning how to slide step and quick. you know be yeah. quick to the plate. Yeah. Learning how to slow the game down in inter squads. Like you always see it, you know, especially with the freshmen. Like the first inter squad, like <laughs> head oh, they're, spinning. <laughs> yeah, they're they're head spinning a little bit. And you know, one thing I think we try to do, you know, well here is get them prepared for that first squad. Like, you know, Coach Mams talks about it a lot, which I think is a great point. Like, our first inner squad, like, we should be we should be moving at our, you know, close to our game speed right. that we will be moving at in the spring. You know, even the first inner squad, just because we've had so much time, we've had enough pens to where we can get our tempo down, we can get our look system down, we can work on a couple picks. You know what I mean? Like, yep. the freshmen should be slowed down, not totally, but should at least, you know, not have the deer in headlights. No like, doubt. You know, as bad as they normally would that first inner squad. Um you know, so that's really, you know, especially with those new guys, like that's what we're spending a lot of time on is just like, hey, this is how, this is what you, these are the basics you need in order to look like a college pitcher out there, be a, start being a successful college pitcher um, and all that stuff. And a lot of that stuff, like I said, is the intangible stuff, how we're carrying ourselves, how we're attacking the zone, how we're moving, you know, stuff like that. So a lot of that stuff has to be tackled early before we start going into you know, hey, let's adjust the release point a little bit or like, hey, the slider of fastball is coming right. out with this axis or whatever. Like, we got to tweak this. It'll help it play a little bit better. Um, that's something more like we can get in early. Like, say a sophomore comes back, like he's already been through it, everything like that. We can dive into that right. a little sure. bit earlier, sophomores, juniors, seniors, um, everything like that. So um, but I think it's exciting for our guys, like I said, like we said at the start, just to have, you know, access to it. I think we're going to have TrackMan installed here. It should be 
in a couple of weeks, but nice. you know, January we got, we'll have Trackman in here, which obviously will be um, awesome for us because yep. you know, we've had rap soda right now, which, you know, which is great, but just, you know, the fact that Trackman's an in game unit, yep. um, just scouting wise and player development wise for our guys. Like I'm excited. I'm excited for them. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm excited, but uh, I mean, I'm really excited for our guys to be able to, you know, have access to that data, really get nitty gritty with it. And I mean, obviously to all, whatever, all 30 MLB teams have yep. access to Trackman data. So, yep. Helps our guys draft wise if they got outlier whatever outlier pitches outlier exit velo some stuff like that at least gets them on the radar a little bit yep. you know, for whoever's looking at the data um, so it'll be exciting we'll obviously be really diving into that here you know preseason in the yep. spring yep um, all that stuff but like I said it's a balance and it's more of us kind of knowing when to push that button to where you know you're kind of looking like hey you know what it's time to where in order for this guy to keep progressing in his career. He's ready, like he's ready for this now. Like whatever, we have got to work on the four seam shape a little bit, or we got to tighten up the slider. Like okay, let's let's dive into that now. Right, you know, is really how it is. So, um, yeah, just that balance of not going into it too early, too early, but also too, like I said, you can't can't totally just put that stuff off, you know, because it, it's well, it's such a valuable tool. Um, right. Eventually, the where I see it, how I see it, you know, eventually working with our guys once the traction is installed and stuff is kind of being able to reverse engineer our pitchers a little bit right. to where, you know what I mean? To where yep. we're seeing this at release, like this is your spin efficiency on the fastball. It's a little bit below what it should be. That means right. something is wrong leading up to release. So then you just kind of work backwards from there. Like, is it the actual release itself? Is it the axis or tilt? Um, if that's okay, is it more kind of what's, why is he casting out around? Might be early towards, you know what I mean? You can start really no question. Work, can work backwards from there. And like I said, kind of reverse engineer the pitchers to where the data can actually tell you that end picture of what needs to happen before. And that's where we can, you know, start attacking that stuff, whether it's movement stuff, release stuff, all that. So um, I think that's what, you know, I'm most excited for, for our guys is to be able to do that. Um, and it gives them real time info. Like that's huge. Like rather than trying to sort through a couple different cues before he makes the adjustment, He's got the validation right away. He's got the numbers where he looks at it. It registers instantly, and he's like, yeah, I got to fix that. Right. You know what I mean? So as far as from a buy-in or just kind of a, you know, sense of urgency from the player development standpoint, I think it's it's a great tool for that as well because the kids, they want that instant gratification. They want to know, like, hey, how am I doing right now? Or, hey, what do I need to do right now? Well, there it is. So, like, let, let's get it done. Right. Let's make the adjustment right here. Um, then they can make that adjustment and see, you know, See how it played. Right. Did I make the right one? Did right. I make the wrong one? So it just speeds up that process a whole lot more, right. uh, which is you know great for them because they they only have a little bit limited amount of time. I mean, you got a lot of guys now with the draft being younger and everything like that. Like you know, a lot of guys, you got three years. Yep. You got to your junior year, maybe your senior year to to get picked up. Otherwise, you're grinding. You know, right. for a free agent sign. You know, working at a facility and stuff like that. So. Yeah. And and to me, it's it's there's. <laughs> You have limited bullets, too, as a pitcher, right? You can't go out there. You can't stand on the mound and throw 150 pitches to get to get it right. You have to. So, to me, the biggest advantage was always we're now closing the gap on the adjustments we're trying to make, right? Absolutely. So, like, Absolutely. if we got a 25-pitch bullpen today and we're trying to change some things, we got to be able to at least get to a point where we feel better going into our next session, our next right. throw session of, hey, we now understand the adjustment that we made. And, and that, you know, having that information, like you said, having the track, man, especially in game, right? Like, okay, something was off today, right? Like, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, maybe not as successful as I wanted to be in this outing. Well, now you can go back and kind of, okay, so let's, first thing, let's check the numbers and compare it to the, la okay, what was wrong here? Okay, oh, well, the, you know, like you said, the, we, we got, we were starting to get, we were casting this, we were getting around the slider. We were making it too spinny. We need to be more through it on top of it tighter. Um, and, and, and I just think to me, to be able to, have that information there to be able to explain it to the guy for them to, like you said, be able to see it, that valid, that instant gratification. Cause that's, you know, that's the society we live in right now, right? It's, it's microwave society where we need it quick. You know what that can do for a guy's confidence, especially when they're going through something to me is it, just, it's massive, right? Yeah. And a lot of times, like you said, confidence is huge. And sometimes, like you said, it's a great point. All it takes is one, right? Like all it takes is for them to kind of, Either whatever they rip that pitch, or like they see you know see something be executed against a hitter, and they're just like, oh shoot, that's I, what it is. I got it. Yep. You see that little spark in their eye, which is awesome. Like you see yeah. a little spark in their eye, the wheels start turning, and they're like, all right, yeah, I got it. Like that's you know that it's very true. That's a great point because that, that that's 
all it takes is one. Yeah. Like it literally can only take just one thing like that. And the guy gets the confidence going and that, that could, for a lot of guys, it's all they need in their careers is just a little bit of belief in them, a little bit of confidence and, and they get rolling. No doubt about it. Um, so the fact that they're able to get on that train instantly or quicker, like you said that, yeah, huge. Yep. And then and just, just from your standpoint here, and, and I know we got to wrap up here soon, but the, the idea of what always, you know, was kind of something that I would always wrestle with a little bit, you know, uh, and I definitely took a side to this, but when you, you have all the information, you go into calling a game, okay? You're sitting there, and, and in college, you know, any pitching coach has probably had to call a game at some point, and you have this information on the hitters, and where do you kind of fall on making sure you're pitching to that guy's comfort out there because he's the most, and he's got to throw the ball, and that guy's strengths versus, okay, this guy might be a good breaking ball hitter, but – that's my guy's best pitch, right? You know, and, and we all find that 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 crossroad. How do you kind of go about navigating that? Or do you do you kind of fall on the I'm sticking with my guy's strengths here because I know that that's what that's what he can execute. So we're gonna go ahead and do it. Yep. Another thing with finding balance, and you know, a lot of it's fault of a young coach too. I know I went through it last you know last fall and stuff like that. Like you're kind of you know self reflecting and looking at things. You're kind of like, eh. There's times we got real report heavy here, you know, because we all right. did. Um, you know, because we did reports on ourselves, you know, like we have our own defensive positioning cards on our own guys for the fall. Like I had pitching reports on our hitters for, you know, our pitchers for our fall. Just to try to make it, you know, as, as spring-like, as game-like as possible. Um, and I know that's one thing looking back, especially last year, like year one, you know, you look, like I said, just, you know, young coach trying to keep learning and, um, you know, self-reflection is kind of like, yeah, you get you get a little report heavy at times. You know, it's right. probably where, you know, it kind of goes most of the times if you're going to be on the – you know, side of air, you're going to kind of get a little report heavy. Um, so just learning from that. And also credit to like a lot of our guys too. Like our guys have been great kind of communicating, like, you know, what they like to throw in certain spots or like what they're feeling during an outing, right. like in the dugout after one inning, they might come in the dugout and be like, Hey, I need this a little bit more. Like right. let's do that. Like they've been great communicating, which, you know, obviously helps us out a lot. Um, so even through that process of our guys, you know, being open and, you know, just, you know, taking ownership of their careers and stuff like that helped, has helped kind of that learning process over the past year, year and a half or whatever to where, you know, you look at it, like got to be a balance like everything else. Like there's certain things where it's like, hey, if we execute this pitch on a rapport, like good chance we get them. But also, too, you don't want that pitch to be something where you know like your guy is, is not not his pitch. Third, fourth best yeah, pitch. it's not right. his pitch, you know. So when it comes down to that type of stuff, I'm going to go with our guy. Like, hey, he's the one out there competing. He's the one that wants to own the pitch. He's the one that, you know, he's chucking it. He's feeling it. Let's ride, let's ride or die with him. You know what I mean? So if it if it's any type of those ride or die scenarios anymore, it's more, you know, going going on the side of like our guy. Like, right. hey, this is our guy, this is his pitch, We're like, hey, this is his stuff. Like if it's do or die right here, let let's do it. Yep. Like, I got I got faith in him that, you know, he's gonna compete and throw that pitch to the best of his ability and it's it's gonna work out. Right. You know, so certainly certainly in that situation where like you're looking, you know, if you're talking about the do or die, am I riding with my guy, am I going with the rapport, like Got to ride with your guy. Yep. You got to got to go with him and his stuff. You know, yep. like, like I said a little bit earlier, there's reasons why they're here. There's reasons why they had success. It's our job to, you know, make those strengths as strong as possible and to amplify those and, you know, put our guys in the best situation to succeed. And I think a lot of times, kind of erring on the side of going with your guy, it's going to work out. You know, more often than not. Yeah, and that's something that, like, again, I, I would always, you know, it's a learning process, right? So getting a couple years into it and like. I, I started to think that like pitch calling is not as important as people think it is. If you're, if you're taking control from the guy, cause that guy's got to execute out there, right? Like at the end of the day, it's up to him. You can call any pitch. If he doesn't execute, it, he doesn't execute it. You can call the wrong pitch necessarily, right? There's only, to me, it was like, it, it just became about, well, there's, there's only a bad way to do this and I'm just going to stay away from it. Right? Like it's like, there's, you know, if I sit there and I, I get too repetitive on what you're doing. And so it's always so fascinating, you know, to hear, you know, other guys talk about how they go about it because again, you know, it's about that guy out there on the mound and he's got to be able to be comfortable. Um, Kind of the last thing that I want to touch on here with you uh, today is is how important is is cultivating confidence in your guys? Because this is something that I always kind of thought about when I would go into, you know, being around the pitchers and and what we were going to do as far as playing goes. is like cultivating confidence is so important, and I always believe that. But you also want to make bullpens challenging when a lot of times, you know, it's just the same as BP, right? Like, yeah, guys want feel-good BP, so they walk out of there feeling good about themselves and confident, but – are they prepared now, right? So how do you kind of go about cultivating that confidence while also still kind of be challenging in bullpen and practice settings? Yeah, great question. 
Um, confidence is huge. I think it, it's everything, especially on the pitching side. You know, when a guy can truly trust his stuff, trust who he is as a pitcher, and just kind of, you know, release and roll with that. I think, you know, that's where you see a lot of, you know, big jumps with guys. A lot of maturity comes out, and they can really, you know, escalate their careers on a good path. Um, a lot of it's just, it's like anything else, kind of the middle ground and balance. Like there's some, it's kind of planning out the days and dosing it to where like, you know what, today needs to be a bullpen day where like we actually, we got to work on something. Right. Here. Like we got to get better at this. Right. Or as where it might be like a week later, or two weeks later, where it's like, you know what, he's done good with this. Like let's switch it up a little bit. Like let's compete here a little bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Either one-on-one bullpens or like, hey, mm-hmm. I'm going to shrink this part of the zone for you. Like, like, like let's attack this here. Let's challenge this a little bit. Because um, there's certainly areas and times for both, no doubt. Um, it's just all about, you know, it's one of the things you are to coaching, the where, you know, you'll fail, you fail at it sometimes and you <laughs> learn and you kind of fail forward with all that stuff of just knowing, learning how to dose that stuff out properly and everything like that because you never want a kid to lose confidence. Right. Um, so I think just having that blend of knowing when you need to work on something but also knowing when, hey, we can have a little bit of fun here, Let, let's compete and make this challenging a little bit, see how we do. Uh, to accomplish this, whatever the goal might be, whether it's a movement thing or a pitch execution thing. Let, let's challenge ourselves a little bit to see if that can get us where we need to be. Um, then also, too, just always showing, you know, always showing that you're invested in their career, showing the care that you have for your guys. Right. I think that's the huge part of it as well. You know, like whether it's during catch play, during a bullpen, or even just hanging out in the dugout. Like if you're just there having a casual conversation with them, talking about, hey, how are you feeling about this? Or, like, how do you think this has gone so far? Like, how are you doing here? Like, yep. how even just simple stuff, like, how did the day go? And then our, we're telling jokes out there. Like, some of the best conversations I've ever had have been with, you know, our own players. No doubt. Out during BP, during, you know, after a bullpen, stuff like that, when you're just talking with the guys. Um, but I think that's important, too, because, like, building those relationships, those individual relationships where they know, like, hey, like, there's a lot of care by, you know, not only my teammates, but my coaching staff here. Like, they care about the process I'm going through right now. They care about my development. Um, you know, that gives them kind of a vote of confidence as well, you know, which I think is a huge. If you're to take, like, the baseball part out of the whole confidence equation, I think that's another huge part of it is just, like, showing that you're there for your guys, showing that you're going to ride or die with them. Um, you know, and that, you know, just telling them, like, showing them, like, hey, you are an important part of what we have going on here, not only baseball-wise, but just in general. You know what I mean? Being yep. a member of this team, being a baseball player on this team, sure, but, like, you know, just in general, like, you're an important part of what we have going on here. You're going through this process right now. There's going to be some ups and downs, but we're, we're going to be good. You know what I mean? Just constantly telling them, like, you're going to be great through this. We got trust in you that you're going to be good. Like, that, that boosts the confidence as well. Um, so I think just more of that relationship aspect of it on top of, you know, just knowing when to dose the competitive challenges versus the actual work sessions. I think those three things are kind of, you know, all cultivated into the whole confidence thing. Yep. I think it's just always so special when you see those guys start to get confident. You know, when you start to finally see a guy struggling with something and then he starts to figure it out and it's just like that's like that's it right there. Like you got it. And yep. then seeing how that confidence comes comes yep. is, is just absolutely, you know, that, that's what makes coaching yep. – really fun yep. especially when you're talking about pitching because it's hard yeah, that's hard. the thing you never want to crush a kid too much <laughs> right like, he's never trying to fail no. he's never trying to miss high and arm side and you know whatever right. like, he's never trying to you know he's like i said he's going through it so like that's where i feel like if you just acknowledge like hey i know you're going through it you're definitely you definitely know you're going through it. like this is a process like you're doing some great things let's keep hammering this like it's gonna it's gonna work out you know yeah. and that's what makes it more meaningful like you talk about the end product when they finally put in the work, they see it come to fruition. It just makes it that much more special because they knew, like, hey, these guys believed in me. They had confidence in me. I worked through this. They helped me through this, and now it's rolling. No question. Like that, that's what makes it truly special on their end and ours. Yep. So. Well, Casey, I really appreciate you sitting down. We're going to have to ha- have you back on and, and get even further in the in the weeds sometimes. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and, yeah. and uh, thanks for thanks for sitting down with us today. We appreciate it. Yeah, Dan, appreciate you and all you guys being here. It's been yeah. uh, this has been fun. So ready for the second half of the day? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that'll conclude our episode. Um, make sure to check it out when we sit down with Casey. We had Coach Mams earlier. We we'll have Coach Torsani and a facility tour coming at you um, all on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. TikTok, make sure you follow us at the backside ground balls.